On today's Locked On Texans podcast, is Joe Mixon better for the Houston Texans with less of a burden? Cody and I dive into that and also how the class of 2022 can unlock this team. You are Locked On Texans, your daily podcast on the Houston Texans. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in, everybody, to this Thursday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your Texans football analyst, John Some Sports Guy Hickman, on the other side of the screen, Texans credential media member, Sports Illustrated's own Cody Davis. Thank you to all of our first-time listeners and viewers. Do us a favor. Just three of them, actually. Subscribe, like, and comment, and I guess I'll throw an extra favor in and Please stick around as Cody and I continue to talk Texans. And thank you to all of our returning listeners coming back to listen to us. Talk about their favorite team. They got a lot of excitement around mm. this team right now. It's popping. Fans are up. They got an uproar going on in the fan base. You're not going to talk about my <laughs> team like that. They fighting back. And that's good to see because for three seasons, it wasn't like that. So I like to see the fight from the fans. It's this. We do this for y'all, man, I, and, I, and, I, and I love it, but we're going to talk about some Texans today. Before we do that, I want to let you guys know that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Cody, take it away. John, it's funny that you talked about how less and how not exciting this fan base was over the previous three, four years. And that was all due to Bill O'Brien. And we're going to close out the show talking about the entity himself because he came out and said taking the GM role was a mistake. We're going to close with that. And then, John, we're going to look at the class of 2022 because we we hinted at it on several occasions. We actually talked about several players from that class because when we take a look at the success when we take a look at the potential of the Houston Texans in 2024, a lot of it is going to come due to the development and the success of the class of 2022. When you look at class of 2022, of course, the one guy, one of the top guys that everybody think of is Damian Pierce. However, Damian Pierce would not have the role as running back number one because Joe Mixon was acquired. You and I broke the news, by the way. <laughs> but Joe Mixon was acquired um, by the Houston Texans in March. And, John, there's a lot of excitement around Joe Mixon. And I know I, I saw some people talk about, you know, whether or not the Houston Texans had put themselves in a position. Because, as we all know, the reason why they went out and got Joe Mixon was simply due to the fact that they came, what, about 4 to $5 million short on signing Saquon Barkley. But... I think Joe Mixon is definitely going to be very good for the Houston Texans in 2024 and 2025. I'm going to keep it at 2025 as of right now because Joe Mixon is getting up there in age. But, John, for me, when I take a look at the success of the Houston Texans, and you guys heard me say that say this over the last week or two, that I believe that this team definitely has an opportunity to be the best offensive team in the league. And even when you take a look at what they can do in a rushing attack, John, I look at it from a standpoint that the Texans can possibly get the best version of Joe Mixon, knowing that he's coming to a team with less of a burden. Well, I, I, I truly feel like with what we're going to be um, in terms of, you know, the, the point of attack with a lot of things, all of that thing, all of that stuff starts right now and what we build in the OTAs and um, you know obviously it's only going to get better and you know with Titus and those guys Laramie coming back I think that'll be a hell of a thing to see because of what we've been getting now it's like damn that's good but when them guys get back it's going to be like you know it's going to be like the Red Sea so um, I definitely look forward to it man and uh, um, in terms of I guess utilizing and other roles in the past game um, I definitely take on all roles um, I definitely can do it. I've been able to do it all of these years. And um, happily with Slowick, I know for a fact that he will be using all my skill sets. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. When looking at Joe Mixon and his arrival to Houston, right, and why we believe better uh, with less of a burden 
for Joe Mixon. It's also for the Houston Texans as well. But let's take a trip back to last season. All right, first and foremost, Houston tied for 22nd in rushing uh, yards per game, right under 97 rushing yards per game, and 28th in rushing uh, yards per carry at 3.7. Now, but Devin Singletary averaged 4.2 yards on the season last year and 4.4 as a starter. Remember, after week nine, he took over, had back-to-back games of 100 yards, 150, 112 on the year. He had four games of 80 or more yards. Three of those were 100-plus yard games. And this is behind an offensive line that experienced an immense amount of change during this season, ups and downs, guys in, guys out. I don't know how many greens we saw play football for the Houston Texans mm-hmm. off- offensively, right? But I say that to say this. Devin Singletary had a career year in Houston, right? And we all believe Joe Mixon is an upgrade, right? Mm -hmm. So Joe isn't needed to be the savior of this offense. Houston has it. He wears number seven. He's from Mm -hmm. California. right? He won rookie of the year last year. He don't need to be nobody's savior. He doesn't need to come into a situation where he needs to be given the ball, uh, the Derrick Henry type of numbers, the Saquon type of numbers, right? Because we're keeping this in mind as well. It sounded like D'Amico Ryans is confident in Damian Pierce to be the true complimentary back in Houston to relieve the load from Joe Mixon and alleviate some of that potential wear and tear. Why do I mention this? Since 2020, Joe Mixon's snap count, three of the last four seasons, Joe Mixon has been within top 10 of offensive snaps played in the NFL for running backs. The one year he was in top 10, y'all want to know where he was at? Where was he? 11. Oh, y'all minging. He was y'all <laughs> minging it up. He was right there. I say that to say this. You look at how both D'Amico Ryan's and uh, Nick Casario have come out and endorsed Damian Pierce. Mm-hmm. I think the job is his. It's not a lot of jobs that would be given on this team, but I think RB2 is one of those jobs where for Damian Pierce, it's yours to lose. If you look at some of the ups and downs that the Bengals went through the last couple of seasons offensively, and they didn't have a lot of downs, but when they did, you can point to the offensive line. Now, Houston was not uh, marginally better than the Cincinnati Bengals, but they were better. I say that to say this. Also, Joe Mixon is coming into a situation where if you got Devin Singletary, who had a career year behind this offensive line, and he didn't even start the full season, and this offensive line is getting better, Imagine what the better talent can do to expand this offense. I also want to point to this, guys. This is a lot of assholes. I know it. But last season, Joe Mixon scored nine TDs on 59 red zone carries, while Devin Singletary had four scores in 34 rushing attempts, right? And this is according to Ben Arthur, an AFC South reporter for Fox Sports. Joe Mixon is stepping into a situation where he's clearly the better guy. The the role and situation itself is clearly better than where he's coming from. He's getting up in age. I think when the season starts, he's going to be around 27.9, maybe 28, whatever the case is. He's been in the league for a good amount of time now. Also take this into consideration. Houston signed him for an extension, a three-year extension, $9 million per. They're going to want to see him around for some time. And the amount of wear and tear that Joe Mixon has on his body, though he's still, you know, we can still call him young man on the show, technically, right? But the amount of wear and tear he has, Houston will love to limit that by having guys relieve him. And I think that's what Damian Pierce is for. So when we say, in my opinion, when we say or when I say better with less of a burden, look at what Joe Mixon can potentially be for this team down the line when some of the wear and tear that he's used to taking is not on him no more, right? In a better situation with better blocking up front. And also, I think just a better overall, I think potential-wise, right? 
they're going to put Joe Mixon in position to succeed. Not to say since he didn't do it, but how much of that success they were wanting to see if Joe Mixon was actually uh, capable with the offensive line. The front, the front five was not as good as they may have wanted it to be. They don't got to do a lot with Joe this year. I think behind this offensive line, Joe can probably average 12 carries, 80 yards per, right, somewhere along those lines. That's not bad. And when you get up in the season, when you're going on that tough stretch, when you're making that playoff push, excuse me, and you're fighting for seeding, that's when you got Joe to come in, who can run the ball well, who can catch the ball well. I think he has over 1,100 yards in the last four seasons or something like that. He can be dynamic, running the ball and catching the ball. But Houston ain't got to put a lot on him to bring out his potential, which is great. We've seen teams run running backs to the ground. That ain't the case with Joe. And in the end, I think you get a much more effective offense, which better with the less of a burden. Hey, guys, let me tell you about Game Time, the app that makes getting tickets, whether you want to drive down to Dallas to get you some NBA Finals tickets, or maybe you want to go see the Astros and boo in person. They make getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on Game Time actually go down closer. It gets to the tip off of the games. And they also got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. What Game Time does for the everyday consumer, you don't got to think. They take the guesswork out of buying tickets. But it's not just limited to sports. No, you can go check out concerts near you, comedy events near you, theater events near you. They got it all on the Game Time app. Right. You also can get an, a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy and your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. And that's a bot as a person with a new kid. I love that. I may not be able to make it. They got customer service that'll go in and say, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. It's covered. So download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Pick up your phone right now, man. Go ahead and download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back in, locked on Texans listeners and viewers. It's time to talk draft classes, mm. right? Nick Casario took over in 2021. That was his first draft class. From that draft class, we've talked about Brevin Jordan. I think he's been one of the favorites of just overall, whether he's potential and he put it all together, I think, last year. We all consider that his best year. Hmm. Davis Mills, to this point in his career, he did what he needed to do. Shout out to D. Millie. Shout out to <laughs> Millie, right? But he's a backup, whether it'll be a backup for Houston or maybe Houston ships him off to – have an opportunity to compete elsewhere. He's a backup for Houston. Mm -hmm. Nico Collins finally had a chance to get that quarterback to prove that uh, I'm probably the best receiver Michigan has seen in a very long time, mm -hmm. and I'm also that next Texan great receiver, right? So you look at some of the foundation groundwork Nick Casario did. Nico's going to headline that class, but Davis Mills has some good moments. So has Brevin Jordan. We point back to the recent Browns playoff game. The 2023 draft class is the savior of this franchise. CJ Stroud, Will Anderson, Tank Dell, Juice Scruggs. Uh, who am I missing? The, the saviors. Like they, they saved this franchise. 2024. This is the draft class where I think when you look up in a couple of seasons, you're going to be like, man. Well, maybe we do need to apologize to Nick Casario for Blake Fisher. Maybe we were wrong about Kamari. That speed don't matter right now. Case over. You are the next Texan great tight end. But the 2022 draft class, hmm. the first Deshaun Washington trade <laughs> hall draft class. You know why I wanted to talk about this today, guys? Because that draft class And that was water. That draft class can unlock this team and can unlock it for this season. 
Cody, what do you believe about Derek Stingley Jr.? What can he be in the NFL? Mm, all pro. All okay. pro corner. <laughs> all right. And I think the conversation between Sauce and Derek Stingley is going to get interested this year. Mm-hmm. Houston has five primetime games or six? Six? No. I think four primetime games, but six national games. We six national games. Early. So nationally, everybody can see what Cody and myself and you guys saw to close out last season. Mm. So well, by the way, to... speaking of primetime, Jets, Texans, primetime, prime Thursday time. night football on Halloween night. It's going to get scary out there. Mm. So he's 2022 draft class. There was a young man that was drafted out of Texas and them. He's from the city of Houston, the Tascacita area, right, who was brought to this team, as we talk about Joe Mixon, being able to perform well and succeed without having the burden on him, was drafted to this team to unlock the running game, and that is the young man himself, Kenya Green. Cody, what have you said about Kenya Green this offseason? The young, the young man has looked and shaped. Finally had an opportunity to get a good view at him due to the rain. We went inside the bubble doing mandatory minicamp, held his own against a veteran defensive lineman. He looked explosive coming off the line of scrimmage. He looks more powerful, looks more faster, just look overall good. And, of course, he's wearing number 76, so the young man is looking really, really, really good. 2022 draft class. Mm-hmm. In the second round, Jalen Petrie out of Baylor had a phenomenal, mm-hmm. sensational, you, you can call it, rookie year, sophomore year. It was more than a slump. It was sadness. Mm-hmm. But he's going into year two of this defense. He's going to have more confidence. He's going to have more a grip of things. Right, 2022 draft class, if he can put it together, now you're looking at a safety unit with Jalen Petrie, Jimmy Ward, Kalen Bullock, and if Houston decides to address it post preseason, but that's a playmaker in waiting right there in Jalen Petrie. One of my favorite players from last year, Christian Harris. Hmm. I've said on this show, the last six games of the 2023 season leading into the playoffs where you had that pick six, we saw a growth from Christian Harris as at, at that linebacker position that we would normally have to see within a year's time. Six games, year worth of growth in six games. D'Amico Ryans has raved about him. Can he be this team's Fred Warner? He has a perfect running mate with Al Shair, who also was in San Fran with who? Fred Warner. Can he put his name in the top 10 to 12 linebacker conversation this year? 2022 draft class. We know who the big three receivers are, right? Mm. Nico, Stefan, Tank. But John Metchie can make things very interesting. He's been highlighted by D'Amico Ryans. C.J. Stroud has said he's running some of the best routes I've ever seen him run. 2022 draft class. Oh, man, as we sit back and talk about Joe Mixon, there's one name that we want to see him redeem himself, and that is the two to the one-two punch. In that backfield, that is Damian Pierce. The 2022 draft class. If you get an all pro version of Derek Stingley, if you get the man mauler in Kenyon Green, if you get the playmaker in Jalen Petrie, if you get that top 10 to 12 linebacker, is he going to be this version for Houston, this uh, uh, Fred Warner version for Houston? If you get that for 17 games, if you get a reliable running back to in Damian Pierce that will not only electrify the team on the field, but will electrify the fans in the stands. But if you get that John Mechie, who you can trust at receiver to make plays, to get open, to create that separation, and we can finally see the touchdown celebration, if you put that all together, you're looking at Three players on the, on the defensive side of the ball that will be potentially starters. Three players on the offensive side of the ball I can put it all together and help this team reach the heights that I think they've never reached before. And that's, you know, getting to at least an AFC conference game in the playoffs. I don't think we've forgotten about the 2022 draft class, Cody. I'm going to let you take away. It's not a forgotten, but coming off of last year, it was – 
where you improved, you improved, you didn't play, you declined, you were abysmal, you need time. That's the facts. We're not judging nobody, not the character or any of that, but that's a fact of last year. If they put that together, CJ Stroud's job is easier. Joe Mixon's job is easier. Whether it be Kamari Lasseter, CJ Henderson, Jeff Okuda, Dino Vasso, Matt Burke, that defensive side of the ball. If Derek Stingley is what he what we believe he will be, the defensive side of the ball is easier. Christian Harris makes that side easy. Jalen Petrie, if you become trustworthy again, look at what you could do. Everything falls in place for this team, and I think that is the group that could unlock the talent. We know 2023 was the savior of this franchise. No doubt about it. But 22 can be the class. When we look at the end of the year, it's like, man, well, they proved themselves. They came back. They balled out. They, they shut everybody up, all our haters, including myself, and they did what needed to be done to redeem themselves. You're looking at an all-time Texan team that can compete and rival against what, the 2012 Texan team, mm. the J.J. Watt team, mm. right? And I'm looking forward to seeing what they can do starting in training camp. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Thursday installment of Locked On Texans. Before we switch over and talk about the entity itself, I want to give you all guys a behind the scenes look of me and John's relationship. Because I think this year probably marks the 10th year anniversary when me and John really started becoming friends. We met at Lamar University, which means we've probably been working with each other for 2014. like 2014. Yeah. yeah. That's what yeah. I'm saying. So, which means we've probably been working with each other, doing podcasts, writing, and stuff for like at least eight years i think we started our last year in college intern at esp in houston that led us here to locked on texans me and john always have a saying that we kobe and shaq and a lot of times when you watch this show you know it's the best of kobe it's the best of shaq but sometimes i take over and give you guys the old three kobe when you know he first went on that run where he scored i think it was like 40 and 50 points in like 10 oh, games man. then there's other times where i take a step back <laughs> and allow John to go to work like what you guys just experienced today and I call that 2000 Shaq which is the only time oh, I can say that Shaq was better than Kobe so that's what that's you guys just Kobe. witnessed I threw the alley <laughs> John went to work <laughs> well I, I just want to say man like the 21 draft class it's easy to put that draft class like we, we, you know we, you we got Nico out of that class you still got mm -hmm. Nico out of that class right mm -hmm. and he just got paid right and again Nico is getting paid is a byproduct of the savior class yep not to say he was a scrub you know I've been a fan of Nico but he needed CJ to get that All right Brevin Jordan he, he did what he had to do last year, and he's also a guy that had to go through the developmental process to get to where he is. And in fairness to BJ, Brevin Jordan, this team before last year didn't have no developmental no, coaches. They did not. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. They did not. It was nothing developmental about this. And they, were, you know, in fairness to the front office, they just lost all the pieces that they worked to put together. So he made way, but that 2021 draft class that Roy Lopez, he's gone. Uh, 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 Gary Wallow, he's gone. Davis Mills is a backup, and credit to D. Millie, he has done what he needed to do mm. in the NFL for Houston. But that's a very forgettable class. They didn't even pick until the third round. Mm -hmm. The first year, this team, and we've called it, if I, if I call it the 23 draft class, the savior draft class, I've called the 22, call you, you as well, I've called the 22 draft class the foundation. Draft yes, class. So that's why I wanted to make sure we highlight those guys before we go into the weekend. The foundation was 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 set right. It was rocky. You got cracks. You had good moments. You had a, you know ups and down. But now when you got somebody that can come in and revamp this whole house hmm. that they built, you, you you're not going to necessarily mess with the foundation. You're just going to upgrade it. But those upgrades are going to come from the guys that were already in the building and knows what's going on. They had to get their stuff together. Ken Green was a young buck coming into the NFL. I think he was, what, like 21, 22 years old? Yep. That's a lineman. Uh, that's baby. He's a baby in the league as a lineman. You got grown men, real live grown men, and we saw this rookie year. Jalen Peach, you got to figure it out, right? But that class, that foundational class can just really be 
what gets this team over the hump. Because the 24 class, I think that's the future. Mm. We're gonna look down the line, like I say, Blake Fisher, you playing? It's, it's up there in the league. You finally playing? Oh, he good too. Oh, okay, my bad, Nick. Oh, uh, K Stover. Oh, boy, he is nice. Kamari, their 40 speed don't matter no more. Bullet, you doing what you got to do, Jawar Jordan. You toting the rock, right? Marcus Harris, all them guys down the line, we may see like their immediate impact. But 22 got something to say. Andre 3000 said the South got something to say. Class of 22 got something to say. Uh, general manager, former general manager, former head coach, the entity himself, Bill O'Brien, had something to say uh, a couple of days ago too, Cody. Yeah, Bill O'Brien came out on a podcast and said that he believed that it was a mistake for him. Looking back on his time with the Houston Texans, he believed that it was a mistake when he took over the role as general manager. John, I'm not going to say that was a mistake. I mean, of course, it was a mistake because when he took over as general manager, that's when you that's basically when his team started going downhill. However, for me at least. I, I look at Bill O'Brien's time here in Houston and I think to myself, that is not the only reason why um, his time wasn't that good. Because before he took over as general manager, you're looking at years, what, 2016, 17, and 18? And the one year when I knew for sure that Bill O'Brien was not that coach was in 2018. Arguably one of the best teams in franchise history. That was the year, correct me if I'm wrong, they started off the season 0-3. They won like 9-10 games in a row. You go into the playoffs with all of this momentum. You have the quarterback. You have the talent. And you get demolished on your home field by the Indianapolis Colts, who barely got into the playoffs that year. That was the moment I said to myself, Bill O'Brien could not and cannot be that guy. How plus, many moments did he have to show y'all? And I was about to say, plus... <laughs> Even when Deshaun, you had the best version of D-Hop, J.J. being healthy and stuff, the one thing that used to always bother me about Bill O'Brien was the fact that it seemed like he was okay being complacent. It seemed like he was okay just Doesn't winning. matter, Brian. AFC South champ. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I brought that up because... Doesn't matter, Brian. Even before we knew how good D'Amico Ryans could be as a head coach. Even before we knew how good C.J. Stroud was going to be as a quarterback. Even before we knew how good class of 2021, 2022, 2023 was going to be. The one thing that I've noticed Coach D'Amico Ryan said going all the way back to his introductory press conference in February of, of 2023. He already had his mindset on bringing this franchise, bringing this city a championship. And that's something that he stood by, and he's still standing 10 toes down by that. I know there's a lot of talk about the Texans talking too much and all this other stuff. No, D'Amico Ryan standing 10 toes down on everything in terms of, one, not running from the smoke, and two, and most importantly, he bringing knows how good. Yeah, exactly. He's bringing it. Bill O'Brien, like you mentioned, doesn't matter, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Back-to-back AFC South, like. Come on, man. Like, yes, the GM role was a nail in the coffin for his senior here in the city of Houston, right. but a lot of his mishaps happened way before he even took over that role. Yeah, I think for Bill O'Brien, Bill O'Brien is a good coach. Let me say that. Mm, but there's a but, but there's a different define good. Well, I mean, you you go out there, you win the division with I think four quarterbacks in one year. Right, regardless of how the division was set up, that's an amazing feat. But there's a difference between bad coaches, good coaches, and coaches that can get you over the hump. What D'Amico Ryan's is what we believe he'll be is a coach that'll get you over the hump. Mm -hmm. And what goes into that is development, which is what I believe Bill O'Brien has always lacked. Yes, right. We got you a first round quarterback. We gave you a first round receiver. You got a first round Hall of Fame talent in JJ Watt. But outside of that, what else is going on? But you can't really credit him for that because when he got here, they already had JJ D. Hop. That's what I'm saying. But you got all of these first round. It's first mm -hmm. round here. It's first round here. And not only were they first round talents, but they were, like I said, Hall of Fame first round talents. Those are guys that JJ is, I think, first or second ballot, right? Third at the oh, moment. he first. He first. Right. He's definitely first. D-Hop, 
Hall of Famer. Deshaun was on a Hall of Fame trajectory, but in, in any case, he was a first round talent quarterback in a 2017 draft class mm -hmm. that was Deshaun uh, 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 and Patrick Mahomes, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, they were able to be very good top heavy. But Bill O'Brien was never able to get the most out of players. We've seen guys go elsewhere and perform, right? Deontay Foreman was drafted to the Houston Texans. He's still in the NFL, and mm -hmm. he's been a very good running back. But in Houston, he was in the doghouse. When this team needed an extra receiver, right, Kiki QT, I know he had the fumble issues, but doghouse. Braxton Miller could never figure it out with him. He was a talent that you just got to find a way to figure it out. I think Bill O'Brien, along with – and I'm going to say this. You got to listen to me. And this is why I'm I'm somewhat shocked that Nick Casario is where he is right now. Very shocked. And in the same breath, I'll say apologetic to doubting him. But uh, Bill O'Brien is a byproduct of the success that two men put together. And on the offensive side of the ball – he is a byproduct of Tom Brady. Tom is doing the developing. Tom helped develop Gronk, uh, Judy Elliman, just a, you know, a name at least. Aaron Dawson. I know you guys don't remember him. He had good moments for, for the New England Patriots on the, as a receiver. Kimbrell Thompson, good moments for the New England Patriots as a receiver. Tyler Underwood, he had moments. It didn't matter who you put around Tom. Tom went out his way to help develop some of these guys. But if you strip Tom away from that, well, we saw it. He was in New England last year and couldn't get no, he, he wasn't no development going on. Hmm. Right? He has lacked being able to develop players. And when you when when that's your MO as a coach, then I, I think that goes into how you view players as a general manager. With the number 41 overall pick, the, new, the Indianapolis coach selected Jonathan Taylor. With the number 40th pick that Houston acquired in the trade for D-Hop from, from the Arizona Cardinals that didn't get a first-round pick, they selected <laughs> Houston's own, most of his own, Ross Blacklock. Right? Uh, Kelly Warren, Warren, whatever. The, like, how, how you view players and how you develop players – I think that goes into how you view him as, as a general manager. And he was never a fit for that role. He's a good coach, but he was never the coach to get you over the hump. And luckily for Houston, um, it's kind of like the devil beating his wife, saying in, in, in the South. Mm -hmm. The sunshine was out, but it was raining. You can see it. You got good moments. It's bright, but you know it's coming. That darkness have to, they have to rain for three seasons in Houston. For the sunshine to come back out, for the rainbow to pop up. You didn't see that rainbow, so you can remember how bad it got. <laughs> you don't want to go back to that rainbow. You're like, you don't want to go back to those that devil beating his wife days to get to the place where they got Nick Casario being able to draft as well as he's drafted, negotiate as well as he's negotiating, uh, sign players in free agency as well as he's been able to sign players in free agencies over the last two seasons once Houston got that monkey off their back. And I have a developed coach like D'Amico Ryans, who guys, not only players, but coaches coming to Houston believe in to develop these guys. That's why I say, man, I think this team has an opportunity to have a developed form where you got guys to be able to come out because they're they coaching them up, they're developing. That was not the case in the past. Thank you guys for listening to today's episode of the Locked On Texans podcast. Uh, please subscribe on YouTube at Locked On Texans. Also follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, it's Cody, C-O-T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, John was definitely finals MVP of this show. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>